Hello, my name is Tiana Martino. I am a postdoc at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Today, I will tell you about checkpoint blockade induced autoimmunity, lessons from mass models of type 1 diabetes. And this work that I'll be presenting is the work I have done as a graduate student at the University of Minnesota in the laboratory of Dr. Brian Fife. But before I begin and get into the specifics of my project, I would like to give you a brief outline of what I'll be discussing today. First, I will introduce the program DEATH-1 or PD-1 signaling pathway. Then I will explain the clinical benefits and challenges associated with PD-1 checkpoint blockade. I will next describe the role of PD-1 in most models of diabetes and I will present our data. And I will close by highlighting the ongoing efforts to develop reliable mark biomarkers for safe and effective use of PD-1 checkpoint blockade. Program DAT1, or PD-1, is expressed on T-cell surface 24 to 48 hours after antigen recognition. PD-1 can bind to ligands PD-L1 or PD-L2 and deliver an inhibitory signal to the T-cell. This results in reduced T-cell target cell contact time, reduced cytotoxicity and cytokine production, as well as reduced T-cell proliferation and survival. Overall, PD-1 is an immune checkpoint that maintains immunohomeostasis so that T cells do not cause immunopathology. However, tumor cells exploit the PD-1 pathway and they express high levels of PD-L1. In addition, tumor infiltrating T cells express high levels of PD-1 and this continuous PD-1, PD-L1 signaling interaction drives progressive T cell dysfunction or exhaustion. PD-1 checkpoint blockade has been shown to restore tumor control in mice. And these fantastic responses, together with responses seen when another immune checkpoint is blocked, really led to the development of clinical inhibitors of PD-1 and pd one signaling. The very first clinical studies showed staggering responses in patients with melanoma and prompted further development and testing. So currently, PD-1 and pd one checkpoint blockade is used to treat over 15 different malignancies, and the response rates are quite encouraging, as you can see here in this table. For example, about 40% of melanoma patients respond favorably to PD-1 blockade, whereas almost 90% of patients with Hodgkin's disease benefit. So this is very exciting. What challenges remain? Most notably, some patients and some tumor types remain poorly responsive to checkpoint blockade, and this is known as primary resistance. Only about 14% of all cancer patients in the United States are benefiting from checkpoint blockade. And this may not seem like a lot, but only 5% of all cancer patients benefit from molecularly targeted therapies. So checkpoint blockade is clearly pushing the envelope, but there's still more work to, need to be done. Besides primary resistance, secondary resistance is another issue in that a fraction of patients relapse after therapy. And finally, a subset of patients develop immune-related adverse events or even overt autoimmunity. And as you can see from this figure, this type of adverse event can affect virtually any organ system. So to safely and effectively use checkpoint blockade, we must identify biomarkers that could distinguish responders from non-responders, design therapies to overcome resistance, and develop biomarkers that could identify people at risk of serious adverse events. There has been quite a bit of progress in identifying these biomarkers that could distinguish responders and non-responders. And probably the most notable biomarker is pre-existence of T-cell infiltration. Close tumors, such as those that do not have considerable T-cell infiltrate, do not respond well to PD-1 checkpoint blockade. Whereas hot tumors, which are those that do have a substantial T-cell infiltrate before treatment, respond favorably to this type of therapy. It is becoming clear that T cell function is governed by not only PD-1 or CTLA-4, but by other inhibitory and activating receptors. So dual inhibitory or activating receptor targeting might be able to overcome resistance. And current clinical trials are designed to test specifically that. Additionally, checkpoint blockade is combined with radiation therapy or chemotherapy in an effort to benefit more patients and overcome both primary and secondary resistance. Now, in terms of biomarkers that predict adverse events, recent work has shown that changes in peripheral B cells and specifically an increase in antibody-producing plasma cells 
can um, correlate with the development of adverse events. And I will touch on this later during my talk. But really what we're trying to accomplish with PD-1 checkpoint blockade is we're trying to unleash cancer-specific T cells and lysis them to kill tumor cells. But because PD-1 can be expressed by a variety of T cells, we might be unleashing self-specific T cells when we administer this therapy and therefore causing damage to healthy cells and tissues and leading to development of immune-related adverse events. As I mentioned previously, these adverse events can manifest in a variety of organs, and they can also range from mild to severe. It seems like their incidence correlates with response to therapy. In other words, patients who develop adverse events are likely the ones who are also responding to therapy and experiencing tumor shrinkage or stable disease. But I want to, I want to highlight that some of these adverse events can be quite serious and involve overt autoimmunity, such as step 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes has been shown to develop in up to 3% of patients treated with PD-1 or PL-1 blocking antibodies. And although that may not seem like a lot, there are over 2,000 active clinical trials right now testing PD-1 checkpoint blockade with an estimated enrollment of half a million patients. So this may be a serious concern going forward. In the Fife lab at the Uni University of Minnesota, we were interested in how does PD-1 regulate cell-specific TMB cells in type 1 diabetes. So to answer this question, we use non-obese diabetic or non-mice to develop diabetes spontaneously, as you can see in this disease curve. Non-mice develop diabetes even more quickly if they lack PD-1. I also want to point out that CD4 and CD8 T cells, as well as B cells, are absolutely required for type 1 diabetes offset in these animals. But it seems like CD4 T cells are playing a critical role because MHC class two or HLA class two alleles are specifically conferring the highest genetic risk for type 1 diabetes development. Another point I want to make is that insulin is a major autoantigen in type 1 diabetes in mice as well as in humans. In fact, almost all patients who are diagnosed before five years of age have detectable insulin-specific autoantibodies, suggesting that this breach in insulin tolerance in the B-cell compartment as well as in CD4 T-cells seems to drive disease. So before I explain how we think, PD-1 regulates B-cell and CD4 T-cell interactions, I will first walk you through what these interactions look like. B-cells and T-cells interact within the germinal center region on the left node. Germinal center B-cells take up antigen, process and present it in the context of MHC class two. This allows them to interact with antigen-specific CD4 T-cells that have this T follicular helper or TFH phenotype. TFH cells provide AL4, AL21, and CD40 ligand stimulation to trigger somatic hypermutation and production of high affinity antibodies by these germinal center B cells. At the same time, another subset of T cells is working to basically dampen this reaction. These cells are known as T follicular regulatory cells, and they express IL10 and also rely on CTLA4 to reduce this amount of CD4 T cell help. All in all, germinal center B cells can acquire two specific fates after receiving help from T cells. They can either become memory B cells or plasma cells that are poised to secrete high affinity antibodies. I really want to highlight that this balance of T follicular helper and regulatory cells is critical there is a significant increase in T follicular helper cells in patients with autoimmunity, including those with type 1 diabetes. And studies in mice have shown that conditional deletion of TFR cells directly leads to autoimmunity. I also want to highlight that PD-1 or PDL1 are expressed by essentially all cells in the germinal center. Germinal center B cells, TFH, and TFR cells all express PD-1 whereas germinal center B cells can express PDL1 or PDL2. So it is very likely that this pathway is playing a role in controlling this cell to cell interaction. It has been known for a while that PD1 deficiency promotes our antibody production in B6 and in valve C mice. However, subsequent studies have found contradictory results. <laughs> 
Several studies have shown that PD-1 deficiency impairs the germinal center, whereas others have shown that PD-1 deficiency enhances the germinal center and leads to better antibody production in the context of infection. Work done at Harvard in the lab of Dr. Arlene Sharp has shown that PD-1 deficiency or blockade affects both TFH and TFR cells, and that the relative ratios of these cell types end up determining the outcome of the germinal center reaction. So to examine how PD-1 regulates B cell and CD4T cell interactions in type 1 diabetes, we developed tetramer reagents that allow us to track insulin-specific CD4T cells. These tetramer reagents are four-pronged soluble ligands of the T cell receptor. They incorporate insulin peptide in the context of MHC class 2, which is bitinylated and conjugated to a fluorescently labeled streptavidin. This allows us to track these cells by flow cytometry. We also developed insulin tetramers to track insulin-specific B cells. These reagents incorporate bitinylated insulin that is conjugated to streptavidin and fluorescently labeled. Using these reagents, we were able to enumerate and phenotype insulin-specific lymphocytes in wild-type non mice as well as those that lack PD-1 or PDL1. We also evaluated the effects of PD-1 pathway blockade in diabetes-prone and diabetes-resistant mice, and I will I'll be sharing some of those data with you today. First, we examined whether insulin-specific CD4 T cells express PD-1. And what you can see in this graph is that as non-mice age and approach diabetes onset, there's an increase in the proportion of cells that is PD-1 positive. In the pancreas, all insulin-specific CD4 T cells express PD-1. And what is very interesting is that the amount of PD-1 expression correlates with how brightly these cells are staining with our touch reagent. In other words, those insulin-specific cells that have the highest affinity for antigen or the highest autoimmune potential express the most PD-1. We next tested, tested the effect of PD-1 blockade on this cell type. What you can see in this graph is that tetramer-positive CD4 T cells increase in number after PD-1 treatment. When we look at the phenotype of these cells, we can see that there is a significant increase in insulin-specific CD4 T cells that have this TFH phenotype that are poised to help B cells create our antibodies. We calculated the ratio of TFH and TFR cells and saw that it was skewed in favor of T follicular helper cells dramatically after PD-1 blockade. So this prompted us to look and examine what is the phenotype of insulin-specific B cells. What I'm showing you here is the number of insulin-specific B cells at various standpoints after PD-1 treatment in non-mice. And you can see that PD-1 blockade increased significantly the number of B cells at all tested endpoints. What is also important is that the phenotype of these cells was different. We observed a significant increase in germinal center B cells that were insulin-specific, and we also saw a trend towards increased insulin-specific plasma cells, so cells that produce antibodies. When we examined antibodies in the serum of treated non-mice, we saw a significant increase, suggesting that PD-1 blockade unleashed insulin or antibody production. This was in parallel with increased allen inflammation. What you can see in this graph is that after anti-PD-1 treatment, about 50% of violets in the pancreas were severely inflamed, as opposed to only about 10% of violets in control animals. Because anti-PD-1 treatment ultimately leads to type 1 diabetes onset and inflammation, we wanted to make sure that the effects we were seeing in the germinal center were due to cell intrinsic PD-1 signaling. So to test that, we set up mixed glomerular chimeras. We sublethally irradiated non-mice, and we reconstituted them with a 50-50 mix of wild-type and PD-1 knockout bone marrow cells. We let these mice reconstitute, and we harvested them six to eight weeks later and examined their uh, T cell repertoire. What you can see here is that is the number of insulin-specific C4 T cells in the thymus, and specifically the number of cells that originate from the wild type or the PD-1 deficient donor. You can see that there's really no difference, suggesting that these cells are developing at about the same rate. But if we look in the periphery, you see that PD-1 knockout cells are now outcompeting the wild-type cells. 
And specifically, if we look at insulin-specific TFH cells or TFR cells, you can see that almost all of them are derived from the P1 deficient donor. So these results suggest that cell intrinsic loss of PD-1 promotes TFH C4 T cell generation. We next wanted to examine whether blocking this CD4 T cell and B cell interaction can reduce the effects of anti PD-1. And to accomplish this, we developed a monoclonal antibody that blocks insulin peptide presentation in the context of MHC class two. So when we treated mice with anti-PD-1, we again observed this robust increase in the number of insulin-specific B cells in the pancreatic lymph node. But when we treated mice with anti-PD-1 and with our monoclonal antibody, insulin 4G8, we saw a reduction. So anti-PD-1 did not so dramatically increase the number of B cells when we use combination therapy. Additionally, when we looked in the pancreas, we saw the fewer islets were severely infiltrated in the case of combination therapy. So this results would suggest that a similar approach could be used in the clinic to mitigate some of the off-target effects of anti-PD-1. So to summarize these findings, what I've shown you so far is that in non-mice, PD-1 blockade leads to an increase in insulin-specific TFH cells, insulin-specific germinal center B cells, and insulin-specific autoantibodies. And this seemed to correlate with type 1 diabetes onset. I don't have time to show you these data, but we observed similar findings in non-mice that lack PD-1 or pd one But when we performed these studies and used an anti pd 2 blocking antibody, we saw no change in the germinal center reaction and no change in insulin or antibodies. So this really suggests that PD-1 and PD-L1 interaction and not PD-1 and PD-L2 are regulating the germinal center. We've also shown that blocking insulin peptide and MHC complex recognition by CD4 T cells using this monoclonal antibody can reduce some of the effects of anti-PD-1 and a similar strategy might be beneficial in the clinic. So again, to address how PD-1 regulates B cell and CD4 T cell interactions in type 1 diabetes, we also wanted to examine a strain of mice that is type 1 diabetes resistant. So to this end, we use B6 IAG7 mice that express the same MHC class 2 molecule as non-mice. And again, as a reminder, this predisposes them to type 1 diabetes risk, but these mice remain diabetes free. We have previously shown that B6 IG7 mice have a pool of naive insulin-specific CD4 T cells on periphery. And now we wanted to test whether PD1 blockade changes the phenotype of these cells or promotes our antibody production. What you can see in this graph is that after anti-PD1 treatment in B6 IG7 mice, we did not detect a significant change in insulin-specific CD4 T cell numbers. We also did not detect a change in their phenotype. We did not observe an increase in TFH cells. Looking at insulin-specific B cells in these mice, we also did not observe a difference. And finally, there was no change in insulin or antibodies after PD-1 blockade in B6 IG7 mice. So to summarize our data from autoimmune prone and autoimmune resistant mice, it seems like there's a requirement for pre-activated TMB cells for anti-PD-1 treatment to lead to type 1 diabetes. In B6 IG7 mice, there are virtually no activated cell-specific TMB cells, so anti-PD-1 treatment does not precipitate type 1 diabetes. But in non-mice, there is already a subclinical autoimmune response there are already detectable cell-specific TMB cells that are activated. And so anti-PD-1 is further unleashing them and precipitating rapid type 1 diabetes onset. So what does this mean for the clinic? Well, it has been shown that people who develop type 1 diabetes after PD-1 or pd one checkpoint blockade are more likely to carry HLA alleles that are associated with type 1 diabetes risk. In humans, these are DR3 and DR4. It has also been shown that a subset of people who develop type 1 diabetes after PD-1 blockade have pre-existing anti-allied antibodies or pre-existing subclinical autoimmune reactivity. And again, this is in line with our findings. 
A separate study looking at patients who developed pituitary gland or lung inflammation after checkpoint blocking found pre-existing pool of autoantibodies that target cell proteins. Again, this is in line with our findings in mouse models as well. So to summarize, PD-1 checkpoint blockade has revolutionized cancer therapy, but not all patients benefit. Primary resistance, relapse after therapy, and development of adverse events following checkpoint blockade are emerging as main challenges. There has been enormous progress in identifying biomarkers that stratify patients who likely benefit from PD-1 blockade. Combination therapy approaches, including those that target T-cell activating receptors or more than one T-cell inhibitor receptor, are likely to reduce both primary and secondary resistance. Our working mouse models of varying type 1 diabetes susceptibilities suggest that pre-existing activated CD4 T-cells and B-cells are required for autoimmunity development after PD-1 checkpoint blockade. In recent clinical studies, identified specific autoantibodies whose emergence pre or during checkpoint blockade correlates with the development of these adverse events. So we propose that HLA testing and screening for common autoantibodies before therapy administration might guide therapy selection or mitigate these adverse events of checkpoint blockade. So with that, I would like to thank my colleagues at the University of Minnesota, specifically Dr. Brian Fife, who was my mentor during graduate work. I would also like to thank my colleagues at the Fred Hutch, uh, everyone in the Greenberg Lab, and especially Dr. Phil Greenberg for his outstanding mentorship. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for the opportunity to present my work.